do that, okay? <laughs> um, can we all stand for the Word of God, please? Uh, the title of today's sermon is From Milk to Steak, From Milk to Steak. Uh, easy way to remember uh, a difficult truth. Uh, so let's uh, read from today's text. It's from Hebrews 5, 7 through 6, 2. Hebrews 5, 7 six, two, uh, through 6, 2. Uh, let's read this in rotation. I'll start with verse 7. <clears throat> in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Let's pray. Father, um, we have been Christian for quite a while, many of us, and in the process of doing so, uh, we don't know whether we have actually matured, whether our love for Christ has e even actually faded throughout the past, and whether we are more obedient, whether we are more diligent, whether we evangelize, whether we read your word and enjoy it day by day, or Father, have we been going in circles in the wilderness, 40 years, 50 years, asking the same questions, why are you so harsh to me, Father? Why do I never get joy out of this? And why can't I do this or that that leads to my pleasure? And all these elementary questions that we keep on asking until we turn 50 and 60, and then we repent, and then we come back to you. And it's the same cycle over and over. Father, I ask that this would not be the case for EPC. May all of us go from milk to steak, from the elementary to the higher principles of Scripture and of your word, so that we may grow and reflect the actual age that we are, Father, in spirit and in truth. Father, we ask that you would receive the worship of your children today. May the Holy Spirit communicate to us so clearly that none of us leave here confused, but with a single conviction that we must follow Christ in obedience to mature into Christ's likeness, Father. And we pray this with hope and expectation that you will do this work. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. Um, does anyone know who this is? Andy Milo Milonakis. Okay, Mil oh, so it's Milo, not Milo. Okay, Ma Milonakis. Um, so guess how old he is? So why are you up in the 35s and 40s right now? Because does he look that old right now? No, right? And so he is actually uh, 1976. He's a uh, 43. Three, four, 40, 42, okay, 42. So he's 42 and he looks like a 15-year-old, right? And the reason this is so is not because he has excellent hygiene or because he has great skin care, right? It's not because of that. It's because he has a very rare condition. I have to read it to uh, explain it to you. It's hypopituitarianism. And so basically, this is a disease where there's hormone glands that don't function well. And so you don't grow as according to your age. And so you don't grow as you should be. And so um, only four out of 100,000 people in the United States uh, succumb to this genetic disorder. And so um, it's a 0.004 chance to get this. Uh, what is so ironic, though, what is so ironic, the tragedy of many Christians today is that over 95% of us, 99% of us, suffer from this spiritually. Spiritually, we all have this condition where we aren't at the age we should be at. We're all immature to all degrees, and I apologize in advance if I have in my voice any shadow of frustration or anger. It is not towards you, it is also towards myself because I suffer from this spiritual immaturity. I am not the age I should be at. 
And I would say so is the case for many of you. I hope that today's text, we will understand how to become spiritually mature, how to become spiritually uh, older than we are right now, and how to eat solid food. And so let's listen to the word of God today. Even though um, this is how immature we are, even though we have received the grace of God for 20 years, 20 years, we are still addicted to everything that is possible to be addicted to. Entertainment, it is drugs, pornography, and then not just the bad things, it's achievement, family, even religion and morality. All these things that can be addicted to, we become addicted to and we make it our idol, even after 20 years of being a Christian. After 30 years of being a Christian, after receiving Jesus' forgiveness for us every day for 30 years, we still don't know how to forgive. We still hate people. We still malign other people. We still cause division, and we are still immature because even after 30 years of receiving the grace of God, we have not grown. It is a spiritual deficiency that we have that's almost genetic. That's why Paul cries out, by this time, you ought to be teachers. By this time, if you've heard the word of God so frequently, you should be teachers. You need to be teaching this. But you need someone to teach you the basic principles all over again, the gospel all over again. You need milk and not solid food. You need milk but not solid food. Because although we've been Christian for a long time, we have a spiritual growth hormone deficit. And therefore, there is no real maturity in us and no real growth in us as well. Dearly beloved, an organism that does not grow is a dead one. A spirit that does not mature is a dead one as well. Do you get that? If you aren't growing, make sure to check if you're alive. Because the last time I checked, Ilya and Ethan are growing every day, my children, right? And if that is the case with us organically, then how much more so spiritually, which is our real life? Are you growing every day? Are you growing in love every day, obedience every day? So with that paradox in mind, let's think about this. How do we overcome our immaturity? How do we overcome our immaturity? How do we actually grow? How do we start exhibiting the maturity that accurately represents the time that we have trusted in Jesus? How do we actually do that? Here is one fake solution that a lot of Christians rely upon. So what's one solution that you're thinking of right now? Anyone? How many of you are thinking this? Okay, I'm going to stop drinking milk. That's kind of embarrassing now. I'm going to start eating steak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the real food. I want the real thing. And so, Father, give me the real, substantial, solid food. How many of you think that way? And that's going to make you mature. Nobody? Okay, that's a good, in- good instinct. Good instinct. Why? A lot of your parents, you know this. Ethan is about a month old. A month old. Now, what if I wanted him to grow faster? And so out of my uh, stupidity, I cook a uh, nice slab of tri-tip steak. And I feed it to him, right? That would harm him rather than help him grow. And so what is the solution for a child, an infant, to actually grow? Milk. It is consistently and faithfully and always drinking the milk that God gives you, that your mother gives you, right? And in this case, you know, we need to keep on drinking milk. It is not something to be ashamed of if we are spiritually immature. We have to drink the milk to become older and stronger to actually eat substantial food. Do you get this? And so the milk is not being downplayed here. It is important, right? And so a lot of you, uh, you know, you feel like you want to get mature, you want to become stronger in your faith. And so a lot of you say, you know, yeah, I want the meat. I want the uh, substantive teachings of God. And so you say, I want to study the difficult passages. I want to dive into systematic theology and maybe even go to seminary. And you want to supplement your faith that way. Other people, they go to leadership positions and they teach youth kids and they hope that doing so will make them mature. But it's not. It doesn't work that way. You can't boost yourself into another another level of existence. You have to get there slowly by what is meant for you at that time, which is milk. And so this is all allegorical. We have to figure out what scripture means when it says we have to drink milk. What is this milk that scripture is talking about? 
Let's look at verse uh, 6, 1 through 2. I'll just read it for us. Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. The elementary doctrine of Christ, that's the milk, okay? And then go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation. And that everything that follows is the elementary stuff that we have to absorb. What is this? Repentance from dead works. Okay, so repenting of your sins, for, for, uh, being forgiven of your sins, and then having faith in God, that's also an elementary doctrine, and then also instruction about washings, baptism is a, uh, one of the examples, so you have to be baptized, and then the laying on of hands, you have to be laid hands upon to be baptized, and then after that, you have to trust in the resurrection of the dead, and then you also have, have to have hope in eternal life, in eternal judgment, right? So all these things are the basic principles that Paul calls, or the author of Hebrews calls, milk. Milk is the very basics and the essentials of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so every week, every week, I talk about the cross in some format. I talk about uh, the work of Jesus and the creatorship of God and the kingship of God and our downfallenness and our sin. Every single week, I've been feeding you milk after milk after milk. And if I don't see you growing, I get worried, Right? Because I give you milk and you're still not growing, right? And so the gospel is the milk that we have to swallow and absorb every time to become mature and eat steak. In other words, you really have to know, you really have to know that God is a creator. A lot of you treat God as your friend, but not as your king. You don't serve him as your king. A lot of you know that Jesus rescued you from your sins, but you still Pretend like you have to work your own salvation. You don't know the gospel yet, the very basic milk of the gospel. A lot of you need to repent and place your faith in God, but you repent and you place your faith in systems and your own abilities. Haven't received the gospel yet. A lot of you receive the gift of the resurrection unto salvation, but a lot of you pretend that there is no resurrection. And so you live like your best life is now. Referring to a book, right? That's the milk that we need to drink in order to become mature. Repeat after me. Let us drink the milk of the gospel. That's what's going to get you there. Now, um, here is a problem that we know is all too real, but it doesn't make sense logically. Logically, it doesn't make sense, but it's a real problem that we see every day, and I just refer to it. When you hear the gospel every week, as I hope uh, I've done, uh, preach to you the gospel, when you hear it every week, why aren't you still growing? Why is there still a lack of maturity, even though you hear the word of God in the gospel every week? Here it is. Okay, let's say the baby seems to be feeding on breast milk, but he's not growing. He's still not growing. What's happening? Usually the reason is not, not that the breast milk is uh, deficient. It's because the baby isn't feeding properly, and I get to see this firsthand now uh, because we have, our, uh, we have our second son now. And so when he should be feeding, he's throwing up, okay? And when he should be feeding, he is sleeping. He falls asleep very well. And when he should be feeding, he wants to play and he looks at the ceiling and he looks at us and he you know, giggles and he plays around. But he isn't eating uh, what he should be eating. And you know, not after long, after you have this, you know, day in and day out, one day you realize you have a malnourished child. You have a malnourished baby who isn't feeding properly, right? And the same thing happens week after week after week. I proclaim the gospel, and you're thinking of something else. I proclaim the gospel, and you're bored. I proclaim the gospel, and you don't absorb it, but you throw it back out. And you reject the gospel. And that's why we aren't absorbing the nutrients that we need to become mature. When Paul says, you do not listen, your, dull, your hearing has become dull, uh, you've become dull of hearing. What he's saying is, no matter how many times the gospel is preached to you, you don't listen because there's something in your mind that blocks out the message of the gospel. And Paul wants to address that directly. Sorry, not Paul, the, the author of Hebrews, right? So every week, when the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, you can't just listen. You really have to listen. Do you get that? You can't just listen. You really have to listen. And here's what listening looks like. Jeremiah 15, 16, it says this. Your words were found. I found your words and what? I ate them. It becomes your nutrients. I ate your word. And then your words became to me what? Nutrients in the form of joy and the delight of my heart. Right? 
And so that's what every week should look like. You just hear the word of God and sometimes you throw it away and you leave the doors without carrying it with you. But what needs to happen is if I give you the gospel, you need to swallow it and then it needs to be transformed into what? Life-giving joy and power in your bellies, in the fruit, in, 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 in the core of who you are in your spirit. The gospel needs to do that for you every day. So now you have people who are dull of hearing on the one side, people who throw out and throw up the gospel whenever they are fed it, and then you have people who hear it and they eat it and they become mature. And we see this division of people that I see in church every week. Every week I see this. Somebody swallowed the gospel and he's growing up and he's becoming very mature. And somebody heard the gospel, but it bounced off his mind because of a, another uh, presupposition. Something else is on that person's mind. And I see growth here, and I see a lack of growth here. I see it every week. And what is the actual difference between the two? What's the actual difference? In other words, when the gospel is proclaimed, how do you know if you are eating it or if you're spitting it out? How do you know this? How do you know if you are right now eating the word of God or if you're spitting it out right now? How do you know this? The key to this, chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, this is the key to understanding this. Obedience leading to suffering, leading to what? Perfection. Obedience leading to suffering, leading to perfection. This is what tells you if you are absorbing the nutrients of the gospel or not. If you obey the gospel. If you obey. So many of you have heard the gospel 20 years, 30 years, and there has been no instance of obedience, and therefore you aren't practicing, you aren't absorbing the nutrients of the gospel, and therefore you aren't growing. There is no obedience. That's the biggest reason. Now, this is referring to Jesus here. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience through what he suffered. And we need to talk about this, right? And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. In other words, what's happening here? Jesus obeyed in the face of suffering and he became perfect. Obedience is how you know if you have eaten the milk of the gospel or if you have spitted it out. Obedience, despite suffering. Now, before we move on, we have to clarify a lot of things here. You might be asking, you know, by looking at this first, what? You know, Jesus had to learn obedience. He had to learn obedience. Does that mean there was a point in his life where he wasn't obedient? That's one question you could ask. A second question. Okay, Jesus had to become perfect? Was he was there a moment in, t in time where he wasn't perfect then? And these are questions that you have to think about, but I give you a resounding scriptural answer based on all of biblical theology, no. It is a resounding no. Jesus did not have to learn obedience. He did not have to become perfect. He had to what? Exhibit this. He had to show it to you. He, Hebrews is all about pointing to Jesus, not just as someone who fulfills salvation for you, but someone who becomes a model of salvation so that you can follow after him, right? And so basically when Hebrews shows you Jesus becoming obedient to become perfect, basically it's like, you know, me telling Ethan, hey, look at your, si look at your sister, um, Ilya. She's obe obedient right now and she's becoming perfect right now and you should emulate this. It's comparing two children to help the younger child know how to grow. Do you get that? So Jesus as our older brother, and that's a warranted uh, description according to, uh, according to the prodigal son uh, uh, proverb, right? And so Jesus as our older brother, he shows us how to actually mature and become perfect, not because of his own perfection, but because he wants to show us how to become mature and how to become people who can eat solid food. This is how you do it. Right? It's like you telling your older son, your younger son, hey, look at your brother. He's eating his broccoli. Look at Jesus. He is a son, and even though he was a son, he what? He subjected himself to God the Father, and he learned obedience despite suffering, and he became perfect. And now you should be so too. Do you get this? Do you get why this scripture is talking about this? Now, here's how the argument goes. If the Son of God demonstrated obedience, then our response to the milk of the gospel must also be one of obedience. Amen? Amen? I mean, don't you want to grow? Yes? Do you want to stay like ourselves right now? Who wants to grow? Let's actually, you know, 
um, response is actually showing with all your body. It's a holistic thing. You can't just agree with me in your mind and not show me, right? It's all about maturity. We're showing that we're actually growing in this. You want to grow. You want to stop wrestling with your addictions. You want to stop fighting with the same issues over and over in your life. You want to stop repenting about the same things that I know you've been repenting over the past three or four years. You want to grow, right? Now, here's the thing about obedience, though. Uh, there is a tough issue in here. Verse 8, it says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. What he suffered. Jesus, the Son of God, had to suffer. That is a crucial element of what it means to obey. Suffering. In other words, true obedience is always joined at the hip to suffering. Do you get that? And a lot of you don't like this. That is connected to suffering. That in order to obey, you have to suffer. And in order to suffer, you have to obey. What does this mean? Obedience and suffering are inseparable. Suffering is what happens when you go against your preferences, your natural inclinations, your instincts. That's what happens when you go against it, right? That's what happens when you go against your, what you desire. Suffering is what happens. And if obedience causes you to go against what you desire the most, then that is suffering. That is by nature suffering. Now, a lot of you think, okay, why can't I become mature without suffering? Why can't I just get the cake without, you know, having to go through the painful process of being refined and being sanctified and learning how to suffer? Why? Because you have this presumption. What is a presumption? You believe this. In order to believe that you do not need to suffer in order to become mature, you must presume that human nature is perfectly good. If human nature is fallen, we must suffer because that is points us that, to the fact that we have to die to ourselves to mature. But if you believe you're fine as you are, that is a deficit in the gospel that you received. The gospel tells you you are sinners. You cannot stay as the way you are, you are. And when the world tells you, go with the flow, I tell you, go against the flow. Because if you go with the flow, you will sin. You will do things that are contrary to the will of God. That's what it was like from the start. So do not presume that you don't have to suffer. Because if you presume that you don't have to suffer, you're presuming that there is no need for growth in the first place because you are complete anyway. It's a logical argument. It's a philosophical argument. Now, suffering is what happens when you go against your preference and your desires. And because the gospel is a weapon, the gospel is a weapon that was fashioned to kill the flesh. Do you get that? The gospel is a dagger fashioned to kill your ego and yourself and your self-aggrandizing properties. Because that is the case, obedience to the gospel then will bring suffering. Do you get the line of this argument? Because the gospel was meant to kill your flesh, obedience to the gospel will kill your flesh. Is that obvious? That's why the apostle says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. And the best way to think about this, I talked about this a couple of times, the best way to think about a living sacrifice is, you know, when you go to Korea, like those uh, hardcore hetchip, the hardcore sushi places, they give you a, uh, a fish that's still breathing and it's cut up. It's cut up. And you're tearing piece by piece and the Koreans sometimes think, you know, oh, this is what freshness is. It's like actually eating something that's alive, right? And, and it's, the fish is going, <laughs> it's, it's trying to live, right? Let me ask you, is that fish alive? No. It is dying. Present tense, dying. And Paul says, be like that fish. You must be dying every single day, gasping for a breath, and that must be dying in yourself. Why? Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Jesus, and I no longer live. The goal of the Christian is to what? Die every day. And what's your goal every day? To make the most of yourself every day. No wonder Christian life is hard. Because you try to live and the gospel tells you to die. You try to go up and make the most of your schedules, to make the most of your families, to become successful, and to make six-figure, seven-figure incomes. And this gospel tells you you have to die for you to realize the life of Christ. And so we have this terrible, in Korean, yangdari. 
One leg planted in the truth of the world, one leg planted here, and it goes further and further apart. You aren't maturing because of that. Because you forget that you have to die to yourself. Repeat after me, I am a living sacrifice. And then imitate me. Remember this, okay? You must die to yourself. If God told us, God told me, okay, hey, David, my will for your life is this. My will for your life that you must obey is this. I want you to become successful. I want your children to become famous billionaires. I want you to make the most out of your job and the most out of your career. I want you to be happy all the time. Who needs obedience for such a commandment? No, that's going with the flow. That's going with the flow. You don't need obedience. Obedience is not a word that you use in such a circumstance. Obedience means going against something that you can't do, dying to yourself. And so that's why when God says, you must die to yourself, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, right? Let your enemy receive your grace. Love your enemies. Don't just, don't just, be neutral with them, love and forgive your enemies, and be one with them. These are all flesh-killing ordinances, all flesh-killing commands that we have to understand is impossible unless it's through what? Repeat after me, obedience. Obedience to kill the flesh. Therefore, suffering. Amen? Do you get the connection now? Therefore, suffering. If you aren't suffering every day, you aren't maturing. Because the world is not the way it should be. When scripture tells you, consider others better than yourself, who actually does that? You know, when I look at, you know, when I look at, you know, Sarah, you are better than me. And I serve her as if I was serving a higher official than me. Who actually does that? But scripture commands it. It tells you to get, get rid of your self-esteem and your self-ego and serve other people as if they were better than you, right? Scripture says, love those who persecute you. Do you love those at least who are neutral to you? Do you know the names of your neighbors? No obedience, no maturity. You will not eat solid food until you get through this. Basically, Scripture promises you obedience will bring suffering. Now, let's get to the basics, um, the very basics. How do we apply this? There's four things to do to apply this. Look at this. How to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? You must swallow this, okay? Swallow this, okay? Get ready to open your mouth. Swallow this. This is how you become mature in your faith, and then you're going to be ready for uh, the meat, the steak, the, the, the fat steak, of mature teachings. This is how you do it. Number one, believe in Jesus that you are saved not by works, but by his grace and mercy displayed on the cross. This will free you to live a life that what is what? Downward mobility. A life that goes downward. A life that seeks to die and not to live. Knowing the cross of Jesus Christ gives you that motivation. Ephesians 2.8.9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And now, if works are taken out of the equation of maturity, basically what happens? You do things not to become mature, you do things because it was commanded of you, and maturity is a byproduct, amen? It just happens, it just happens. Number two, know that your purpose in life is not to live but to die. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with, with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by what? Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Number three, hardest part. Desire to suffer because of your obedience. Otherwise, you will not grow. Okay, number three is where the actual application is. Repeat after me, desire to suffer for my obedience to the gospel. In Acts chapter 5, after the disciples of Jesus were flogged and their, basically their backs were stripped from them, the skin of the backs were stripped from them, what happened as they left home? They left, quote-unquote, quote rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. Rejoicing. 
you must desire to suffer. A lot of sermons that talk about suffering, uh, a lot of you respond like this, oh, I'm going to get ready to suffer. I'm just going to be passively ready to suffer. You know, I'm going to wait. And if it does come, I will have the strength to overcome it. But nobody ever says, I desire to suffer now because my Lord suffered. How many of you will apply this by saying, tomorrow I hope my boss persecutes me, gives me a tough time? What if there's no other way to mature? What if the colleague that's always talking behind your back, God, that's God's planted instrument for you to become strong in your faith? There's no other way. What if, what if that's the only way? Why do husbands and wives fight all the time? Because you won't let your life groups go that deep into your skin. And so because your wife or because your husband is the only person that you will stick with even though you fight, that's what God uses to sanctify you. What if that's the only way? Desire suffering. Otherwise, you will not grow. Now, when I say desire suffering, you start worrying, okay, do I, you know, uh, you know, go to Google, purchase a flight for North Korea, right? No. Scripture is not telling spiritual infants to go to North Korea. Scripture is not telling spiritual infants who don't know how to digest milk to take a bullet for the Lord. Scripture is not telling you to go to an Islamic area and, and share your faith. Start with the small things. Start with the small things. What does this mean? Start by doing the dishes for your wife one more time. That's you killing yourself. Okay? Do the dishes one more time. Be patient with your son or your daughter one more time. One more time. Suffer for that. Can you do this? Amen? Amen. This is exciting, right? We can actually do this to become mature, right? The small things, okay? Another thing, you know, go to all the fellowships to actually go to the communities and actually serve people, right? Let me give you an example. Like how, okay, let's say, you know, our Labor Day retreat um, on, it's always on the first week of September. How many of you go there because, and you don't have to raise your hand for this. I don't want to, want to embarrass you. How many of you go there because it's a nutritious, wholesome time for your family? Because you get to take your children and just rest with them. And it's not because you desire to live for the uh, will of God. If I told you, okay, we're going to blank out the first weekend of September, and I want you to go there. How many of you, if you didn't have all the things that we do there that's attractive, the campfires and the, and the steaks and the, and the food and the conversation, if we didn't have that, how many of you would not go because there's something better to do with your life? There are priorities that you have where it's self-aggrandizing. And let me tell you, one way to suffer, give that up. This is so practical. It's so hard to get you guys to, in one place to do something together, right? All the leaders, I ask you to come, and you don't come because there's always something a little more important. But what if the gospel is true? What if there is eternal damnation, and what if there is eternal life in the presence of Christ? Then why is your... Okay, business meeting, that's probably the most important. Why is that so important? And that's the frustration I have for myself. It's not you guys, okay? Why can't we block out certain parts of our calendar? Because there's always something more important. That's the best way to suffer for the gospel. Swip, flip, flip around your priorities. Suffer that way. Come on. Like you've given me excuses over text message why you aren't coming to church and you spent that time doing what you want. Are you happier because of that? Have you earned more money because of that? Where's your Ferrari then? Right? Suffer in the small ways. Give up five minutes of your life to get to know your neighbors and some of his needs. Forgive, we, we need to talk about this. Forgive your brother or your sister who wronged you. If you don't know that, you don't know what the cross is about. Forgive, right? Some of you have long blood feuds and don't let go. Suffer for that. Lift up your opponent and forgive him and say, you are beloved and I love you because Christ loves you. And see if you don't become mature. You're ready for solid food then. Another way. Serve those who are weaker than you in the name of Jesus. 
you look around you and there are people still drinking milk and throwing it up. Serve them. Without lording it over them, serve them humbly and you will be ready for steak. Amen? Day by day, when you practice obedience and suffering in the small things, when you practice this, you will have discovered that you have moved from milk to steak. You will have moved. You will form spiritual bones and muscles to obey in the tougher moments of life. You see this principle in Scripture everywhere. God's will for us is not just to be saved. Do you get that? A lot of people in the KM, they keep on say, telling me, Pastor, I have to go to heaven. I have to be saved. And it sounds so self-centered. God doesn't want you to just be saved. He doesn't want you to run out of this world as if you're escaping Saddam and Gomorrah with your hair on fire and barely making it. God wants you to be what? Mature and complete and perfected in him, right? And so next verse. This is the verse for all pastors. If you go to seminary, don't tattoo this verse, but have it on your heart, okay? Have it on your heart. It's too long for a tattoo, okay? So. This is what we fight for. Every leader in this church, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone, warning and teaching and doing all the things that we do for what? With all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ, that you may be older, stronger, more bone and muscle. That's the reason that I'm here, to present you mature before Christ on the day that he comes, to, that you would be eating steak with him in heaven. And to present you mature in Christ, brothers and sisters, I stand here to tell you that the only way you're going to get there to make you mature before Christ, to re recognize the destiny that you're called to, is for you to suffer through obedience. It starts with the small things. But it ends with maybe, if God is gracious, it ends with the tougher things. Uh, John Chow um, he died last year, November. Uh, he was shot with arrows at Sentinel Island. And a lot of us had talks about this. You know, a lot of you came up to me, couldn't have he have been wiser? Couldn't he have, you know, waited and, you know, uh, couldn't he have found neighbors to preach the gospel to in his own local Vancouver, for example? Now, a lot of us talked about this, but let me tell you what. John Chow, uh, he suffered for the gospel. He was mature. Uh, he made headlines everywhere. He, apparently, he wrote in a diary. This is, diary has been recovered from the Sentinel Islands. And in this diary, he talked about one of his first days that he arrived at Sentinel Islands. He paid off a fisherman, uh, about 360 bucks or something, to get him close to the island. And on that boat, a little away from the seashore, he shouted the first thing to a group of people who were gathered. He shouted out, my name is John. I love you. And Jesus loves you. And a small kid, maybe a teenager, pulled a, a, a bow and shot an arrow at him. And apparently, it says in his diary, because it, there are still more entries afterwards, it didn't kill him. It grazed him, and it hit the Bible he had in his hand somehow. So he survived, and he had a taste of what it meant to suffer for God. He was scared, obviously scared, right? So next diary entry, he says this, God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. But even then, he goes back. Um, he brought footballs, and he brought food, and he brought clothing, and he brought a Bible uh, for the Sentinel people. And as he was taking it to them, he was shot multiple times, and he died. The world makes fun of this, because the purpose of the world is, once again, what? Upward mobility, to live your best life now. But John, his paradigm was what? To die now for the gospel. And he did it literally. John Chow was mature. Just like Jesus, he obeyed unto death. And like the arrow that took his life, John flew, I believe, straight and true to the presence of God, mature. He arrived mature, ready for a steak, ready for the banquet of the Lamb, you get this? You are not going to enjoy the food up there if 
you don't practice right now. John was 26 years old when he died. I'm 36. He's 10 years younger than me. Spiritually, he's centuries older than I am. Personally, I am sick and tired of drinking milk all the time. Of preaching a word to you and then me, myself, struggling to obey what I myself have taught. The very basic principles of the milk of the gospel, I am sick and tired of that. And sorry, I am sick and tired of hearing the same complaints over and over. That I can't get over my addictions. I can't repent before God because I'm too fed up with myself and, and the world. And, and, you know, I, and people keep on asking, is the Bible true? Is it, can I really trust it? Can I li- really live for Jesus? And all these elementary teachings, it's necessary, but I'm sick and tired of it. I want steak. I want to grow. Praise can you come up? Dearly beloved EPC, and I don't say this because I wrote it here. I say it because I mean it. I really love you. I really want you to become mature in Christ so that one day when EPC gathers in heaven, that we would all be mature before Christ. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to all look me in the eyes. I'll ask you a question. Please respond the most faithfully you can. How old are you? How old are you? How old are you? Have you grown one inch more than the day you believed in Jesus? Do you hate sin one speck more than the day you first repented? Do you hate sin more now? Has there been one more act of obedience than you would have done a year ago? Then you're growing, amen, if that's happening. But I have to ask you, how old are you? I will give you milk every week. The milk of the gospel is what we need to grow. But some of you need to be telling me, I'm sick and tired of that. I need meat. I want to suffer for the gospel. I want to know what my Lord and Savior Jesus went through when he carried the cross. I want to know what that felt like. I want to know what Jesus meant when he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. I want to know what John felt when he felt that arrow pierce his lung. I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. And here's how we start. Prioritize your calendar a little bit differently. Talk with your spouse a little more like you're talking with Jesus. Serve the people here in your church. There's excellent opportunities for you to obey every time we gather as a church because you interact with one another, right? And so can't you do something for each other that's special? That you don't have to brush each other off like the people we do out there in society? If you're going to reach San Jose, how are we going to do that if we don't start here? I want you to cry out in my heart, in your heart. I want to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Because the world is not the way it should be. And Christ told me how to live. And so may I follow Christ and not the world. Obedience unto suffering, unto perfection. Obedience unto suffering, unto perfection. That's the only way you're going to grow. Let's close our eyes. Ask yourself, how old am I? And then, don't talk to me. You're not talking to me. You're not talking to yourself. You're talking with God. You need to be honest about your walk with Him. 20 years, you might have been a Christian. 10 years, you might have been a Christian. But have you grown? You need to tell this to God. God is watching you grow. And it's like He's feeding a 20-year-old with breast milk still. And you must talk with Him right now. You must tell him, I'm going to stop throwing up the milk of the gospel when you feed it to me. I'm going to swallow it. I'm going to obey it. And I'm going to suffer for that sake. And day by day when I do that, I will become mature just the way you intended for me, Father. Let that be your prayer this day.
you know, we're, we were going to talk about the seven I am's of Jesus. And I, I deliberately did not talk about Jesus because every time I gave you the name of Jesus, you spat it out and you didn't obey. And so I'm taking this time right now because it's crucial. If you want to make the sermons that I'm going to preach for the next 10 or 15 years valuable to your lives, you need to know what to do with it. It is obedience that leads to suffering. And if you're going to come here every week, 56 times in a year, and if you're going to make that special, obedience, leading unto suffering, leading unto perfection, that is what your goal must be. Hear God talking to you and calling your name right now and have this time to talk with Him. Ask Him about your spiritual age. Ask Him if there is a spiritual growth hormone deficit. And then let Him minister unto you. Let Him give you the gospel and this time drink it. Eat it and let it be joy in your heart that comes out as a result. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for this congregation.